Okay, so that was the first kind of group of drugs. The next group of drugs are drugs that conceptually you are familiar with, um, but we haven't really talked about them in this in this context of being treatments. And so we're going to look at pressor agents or vasopressor agents. And so these drugs are really useful in promoting the vasoconstriction that has to go along with other um, routes of uh, of treatment. Um, in this case, fluid replacement in the context of hypovolemic shock. Okay, and these drugs are your adrenergic receptor agonists. And so the clinical conditions where where pressors are used include septic and hemorrhagic shock, as well as cardiogenic shock, um, all of which will be discussed in this next round of cases. And we can also talk about using pressor agents in the context of you know really acute severe heart failure that has you know, really low blood pressures um, and even bradycardias as well. <clears throat> Just kind of some quick terminology. Um, and this I think is kind of historically important and I really didn't know where to put it, so I'll put it in this lecture. Uh, let me slide this window down a little bit. Here we go. Um, so we all know epinephrine um, comes from the Greek word epinephron, meaning above the kidneys. Uh, and that's the site of where epinephrine is made, of course. Um, if you're from the other side of the pond, from the UK, you may have heard of it called adrenaline. Adrenaline is the Latin equivalent to the Greek word epinephrine. So adrenal means above the kidneys, just like epinephron means above the kidneys in Greek. Uh, norepinephrine is an American um, way of saying noradrenaline, um, comparing the British way versus the American way. Um, norepinephrine is really a old medicinal chemistry term to talk about a demethylated epinephrine molecule. And likewise, noradrenaline is a demethylated adrenaline molecule. Okay. And so the, the way this kind of worked out is that, um, you know, if you look at the biochemistry, dopamine gets converted into norepinephrine, norepinephrine gets converted into epinephrine. Okay. Um, Interestingly enough, as we discovered epinephrine in 1901, and we didn't discover norepinephrine, at least in terms of its chemical structure, until 1946. And so that's kind of how this terminology um, uh, came about. So I think that's kind of interesting. But anyway, when we talk about pressors, we're talking about epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, these are your classic kind of pressor agents. These are the endogenous molecules that act as pressors. And what we do is we've made drugs that look like these two neurotransmitters um, to be of clinical benefit, okay? And so what we're doing now is we're looking at the adrenergic receptor system and the neurotransmitters that, um, that, that modulate them, and we're gonna hone in on alpha-1 again. And so remember we said, you know, alpha-1 blockers make really good antihypertensives. Now we're gonna talk about alpha-1 agonists. Okay, and so this is that classic pathway of here's your G-protein coupled receptor. The agonist comes in, here's the alpha-1 receptor, and this is, again, this is in vascular smooth muscle. <coughs> and there's the signaling pathway over here. Basically, um, IP3 stimulates this calcium-dependent protein kinase, um, and essentially what happens is that these activated kinases increase the plasma constant, or the um, the cytosolic concentration of calcium, and that promotes smooth muscle contraction, okay? And so these alpha-1 agonists, um, of which epinephrine and norepinephrine are included, um, promote alpha-1 agonism, which promotes smooth muscle contraction, and that'll increase blood pressure, and that's how you get that pressor effect, okay? And so alpha-1 agonists do tons of things in all different tissues, and so some of the um, physiologic um, consequences to alpha-1 agonism are depicted here. And as we go through all of these different blocks and all these different um, physiologies, you'll learn about all of these different processes. I just kind of wanted to put this here to, to kind of be our, our guidepost. Um, understand too that there's a an eye component. So when alpha-1 agonist um, hits the pupillary dilator, uh, muscle that produces contraction, and this is called medriasis. And I wanted to show you what medriasis looks like. So this is medriasis with an alpha-1 antagonist, uh, alpha-1 agonist, and here's meiosis, and so that's the opposite effect. So, <clears throat> and not to be confused with this meiosis, even though it's it's pronounced the same way, the spelling is different. So this is meiosis in the eye, and here's meiosis in your cell and molecular uh, biochemistry textbooks.
understand too that when we talk about these neurotransmitters, um, we're really looking at the ability of epinephrine and norepinephrine to bind to the beta, the beta receptors and the alpha receptors systemically. And so I kind of like this um, depiction, and you can kind of come back to this as we as we go through the curriculum. But uh, in terms of affinities, norepinephrine um, has a really really potent or really strong affinity um, to to alpha one receptors, which are in the peripheral. Um, vasculature, alpha-2 receptors, which are in the CNS compartment, and beta-1 receptors, okay? The affinity of norepinephrine to beta-2 is quite small, as depicted by this graphic, okay? In contrast, epinephrine has the greatest affinity to the alpha-2 receptor, which is, again, central, and near equal affinities to beta-1, beta-2, and alpha-1. Okay, and so I kind of like these diagrams um, more so than this, um, but if you're mathematically inclined, this might make a little bit more sense. Um, how I remember it is norepinephrine is not interested in beta-2, and epinephrine loves alpha-2. Um, that's pretty much how I remember the, the difference between these. So epinephrine, you know, in terms of it being a drug, we can kind of go back to where do we see epinephrine injections? And so go back to allergy. And so people that have allergic reactions to, to bees um, or flowers, <laughs> as well as uh, peanuts, you know, these people will often carry an EpiPen. Um, and there's plenty of um, politics involved with the price of the EpiPen um, in the last year. If you remember, that was all over the, uh, the media. Um, and so epinephrine is a good drug um, for the um, immune anaphylaxis. Um, but it's also a positive presser agent um, working through uh, your alpha-1, beta-2, and beta-1 receptors, um, as well as your alpha-2 receptors centrally. <coughs> Excuse me. Other drugs that are your, your classic kind of presser agents are your nonspecific beta agonists. And so here the classic example would be isoproteranol. And this, this drug is uh, specific for all the beta receptors, beta-1, 2, and 3. Um, and it has virtually no alpha activity. And so we used to use isoproteranol for asthma because of the beta-2 effect, um, but the cardiac effects cause lots of problems in patients, and that actually led to the development of beta-2 specific agonists, uh, such as salmeterol and albuterol. Um, isoproteranol, when you administer it initially, can cause a, will cause a major increase in blood pressure, um, at least initially, until um, all of the different uh, various compartments adjust for that. Uh, and we typically use isoproteranol in emergencies to positively affect heart rates um, in terms of like low bradycardias, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. I really like this, this summary slide, and I wanted to give this to you guys um, at some point during the curriculum, and I think now is kind of a good time uh, to give it. But I think, you know, when, when I talked about making uh, summary tables for all these different drug classes and their indications and so forth, this is kind of what I had in mind. And I think you guys should be making them, generating these tables by yourself um, because, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> because it helps you remember it um, if you fill it out. But I, you know, I wanted to put these out there periodically so that you can study off of them. So this is a, a great summary table. So here's your alpha-1 receptor. And this basically determines um, the potency of the various agonists that exist. And so epinephrine is more potent on the alpha-1 receptor than norepinephrine, and norepinephrine is more potent on the alpha-1 receptor than the uh, chemically made phenylephrine. Okay, and so then you can talk about the prototypical antagonist, prazosin. Um, that's not part of this lecture, but it is uh, a summary slide, of course. And then here's the tissue distribution of the alpha-1 receptor and the response that goes along with it. And so you can do the same thing for all these different receptors. So I encourage you strongly to start doing these types of tables by yourself. I hope you have started them um, at least in the uh, in the previous block when we talked about antibiotics. Um, and you'll see these types of tables coming out um, uh, throughout the curriculum. If you want to look for these tables uh, specifically, or if you need help generating one, please let me know. Um, but I think that um, having a series of, of incomplete tables that you kind of go back and forth um, to and fill out while this curriculum is going is going to be really beneficial to help you study.
Okay, so here's here's a good example of how you should start uh, looking at some of this. So um, remember back uh, when we had talked about some of these catecholamines, um, of which epinephrine and norepinephrine are, um, we talked about the synthesis of how these, these compounds are made in the body. It all starts with tyrosine. Tyrosine gets converted into L-dopa. L-dopa gets converted into dopamine. And dopamine gets converted into norepinephrine and, and possibly epinephrine, depending on which tissue. Um, dopamine also has affinity to both beta and alpha and, of course, dopamine receptors. Okay, And so dopamine as a drug is actually really beneficial in the context of shock. Okay, so there's the signaling pathway through some of the dopamine receptors. Um, it's very similar to how beta receptors operate. Um, there is a potassium component to some of the other dopamine receptors that doesn't exist for the beta receptors, um, but we'll get into that in the CNS portion of the curriculum. But understand that dopamine has positive effects on beta 1, um, so this is at, at the heart, uh, beta 2 in the smooth muscle in the, in the bronchi in the lung, as well as alpha-1 in the um, arterioles and, and, and arteries of the kidney, as well as dopamine receptors hitting the dopamine um, receptor subtypes that exist in the kidney as well. So dopamine is a great drug. Um, it definitely will affect the autonomic nervous system, and its unique properties um, show really good clinical benefits in patients that have hypovolemic shock. Okay, um, because of its beta-1 agonist effects, we see increases in inotropy at the heart. Um, and unlike other, and this is the key, unlike other adrenergic ag agonists, um, it'll actually increase blood flow to the kidneys. And so this is actually really clinically beneficial. So when you have a patient who has, um, who's experienced dramatic volume loss, so you know, gunshot wound or stab wound or something. Um, they're, they're, there's going to be a very potent vasoconstrictor um, response that's going to be activated um, systemically if you use some of these um, vasopressors like epinephrine and, and norepinephrine that we had talked about. The problem is, is that um, you know if the kidney itself doesn't get perfusion, um, it's actually going to stimulate that renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and that's going to be the stimulating factor to, to really kind of exacerbate disease um, progression. And it's going to make managing these patients worse. And so, you know, at, you know for the punchline, what we do is we supply uh, dopamine type drugs um, because they actually increase perfusion or, or blood flow to the kidneys. And this is through an alpha-1 and dopamine-1 receptor um, uh, mechanism. Okay. And, uh, and so, you know, there's, there's a risk of using um, an alpha agonist to increase the blood flow, uh, leading to kidney failure if the agonist is administered long enough. And so we can kind of circumvent this problem by giving something like dopamine or uh, dobutamine, um, which has both affinity for the uh, beta receptors, but also the, uh, the dopamine receptors. And so this is kind of an interesting strategy to... Um, kind of save the kidneys by administering this drug. And so it has all of the positive inotropic effects um, on the beta-1 receptor, but it also causes an increased blood flow uh, to the kidneys, which is really going to be clinically beneficial um, because once those kidneys have a reduced blood flow, that renin angiotensin aldosterone system is going to kick in and it's going to make management of those patients uh, a lot more difficult. Okay, so this was kind of a brief overview of drugs that can be used for shock. Um, they don't really fit into a specific um, category, but basically look at the patient's signs and symptoms and see where some of these positive inotropes, um, such as epinephrine and norepinephrine,